So this is the second and final part to painting this realistic portrait. If you watched the first one and enjoyed it, thank you so much. And if you're new here, you can see the original one up on my channel. I posted it about two weeks ago. All the information about supplies are in that video. But the new thing we're doing in this one is we're using some 3M vinyl tape, which I have up on the screen right now. Sometimes when using shields, it's annoying or difficult to use in a very large area, like this section of the head where the hair is. So instead what I'm doing is laying down some of this 3M vinyl tape and then masking off the side that I don't want paint on with some normal masking tape. This way I don't have to worry about using a large clumsy shield with my left hand. For the color, I'm using black by Createx Illustration Colors, and I'm starting to lay in the hair in small motions. Now, if you watched my hair tutorial, I mentioned during it that when I'm painting in hair like this, I'm not actually painting the hair. What I'm doing is I'm painting in lines between the highlights of hair, so I'm actually painting in the shadows right now. There are a lot of ways to paint hair, but I found this way to be extremely forgiving because we don't have to worry too much about making any sort of mistakes because if we do, they're going to get cleaned up in the next phase where we come in with an eraser or a blade to start adding in some of the brighter highlights. Since this is the first layer of hair, remember not to be hard on yourself. Don't worry if it's not looking perfect or it's looking slightly off. It's always going to look strange in this stage. So just lay it in and try to lay it in lightly and know that you're going to be able to adjust it and clean it up within the next few layers. Layers. So I'm going to zoom in here so you can see more detail. What I'm doing is I'm switching over to my X-Acto blade and then I'm pulling out a few very bright highlights. These are basically flyaway hairs and I'm trying to look at my reference to do the best I can to lay these in in random areas. Here I'm switching over to a black colored pencil. This one's made by Prismacolor which we talked about in the first part of this video. And I just love this for adding in small hairs. In my experience I found this to be the easiest way. I used to use brushes and airbrushes with small little shields but with this I can add these in in random areas looking at my reference and just, just do it very quickly. So if you're trying to add in small flyaway hairs that are dark try using a color pencil it works very well sometimes when using colored pencils it can get difficult to match the right color for the hair that you're painting but in this case she's a dark brunette so the black colored pencil works just fine for this an important thing to remember here is while we're trying to place hairs in we're trying to get a random shape to them and the easiest way to keep the lines consistent um, so you have full control is to continually spray I never let up the air on my airbrush the way I control the start and stop of the paint is by moving my finger forward or back on the trigger to control the paint coming out but I'm never releasing my finger from the air spraying the entire time this way you get a nice clean line so as you can see here, as I remove the tape, the line is extremely sharp. So if we're trying to get something that has a relatively photorealistic look, this is not going to be so great. So we're going to have to clean up the edges. So what I'm doing is I'm using my airbrush, just spraying a few flyaway hairs. And eventually I can come in with an eraser or two and kind of soften up that edge because we don't want an edge too sharp. The colored pencil also works great for this too to get some of the sharper flyaway hairs in. But starting with an airbrush too, you're going to get a variety in lines, some softer and some a bit sharper with the colored pencil. You'll notice that in all these painting tutorials, uh, under my right hand, I always place either a piece of paper or a piece of wax paper. The purpose of this is to prevent my right hand from touching the painting. Createx illustration colors are pretty delicate. That's what makes them so great and easy to remove with an eraser for pulling out highlights. But if your palm touches it and there's a bit of sweat on your hand, it's going to lift off areas. So just be careful of that. In a few days, in about 48 hours, it's dry and it's, it's very hard. So you don't have to worry about it lifting off. But in the first 24 hours or so, you have to be careful. So use something to protect your, uh, your painting so that your hand doesn't rest on it. While I'm using the colored pencil to add in these flyaway hairs, I'm constantly looking back at my reference and I want to do the best I can to mimic what I see. The purpose of this painting is to copy my photo reference the best I can. Now, when you do that, you learn a lot about the subject you're doing. This is essentially practice. I'm learning about different things like right here, the, the way the hair flows, the way we get some flyaway hairs closer to the scalp and some off in the distance, the way skin texture reflects light. The whole purpose of this is a learning experience. If we were to categorize this in any type of art, this would most likely be considered photorealism because what we're doing is trying to copy a photo. I see a lot of YouTube videos where they have scenes that are technically photorealistic and they call it realism, which isn't really true. Realism was a movement in the mid-19th century with artists like Courbet and Millet, or Millet, however you want to pronounce it. 
In art history, the term realism is most often used to describe the concept rather than the techniques used, and the realists of the mid 19th century tried to paint ordinary, everyday subjects. An example is Mie's Gleaners, which depicts peasant women gleaning wheat after a harvest. The painting was intended to portray an aspect of human life which wasn't romanticized or exaggerated. The realist movement began in France in the 1840s as a counter to romanticism and history painters like Delacroix and Ang. History paintings were much more idealized and invented rather than snapshots of everyday life like the realists. Going back to our painting here, we can use the terms mimesis or naturalism to categorize this type of portrait painting since the goal here is to create a detailed and accurate representation of this woman. So with that being said, I don't think it matters what we call each type of artwork because these are really terms made up by art historians and art critics who need some way to group and categorize their artwork. I'm going to stop myself here so this video doesn't get too long, but I do think that it's important to know some of the art history because everything we're working on is part of a human invention that has a deep history going back many, many generations. So if I could bring up some art history, I usually will in the painting. All right, so let's get back to this tutorial. Going back to my colored pencil, this one is a black Prisma colored pencil. And what I'm doing is I'm drawing in some of these thin flyaway hairs around the outside and toward the uh, scalp where the forehead is. And what I want to do is try to break up um, areas between the transition of the skin and the hair. So it, it's more of a smooth transition from the forehead to the hair itself. You don't want it to be too sharp to where it looks like a helmet. So again, what I like to do is look at my reference and do the best I can to try to replicate that. As I move along down to the eye here, I'm pulling out a few highlights with a Dremel that I retrofitted to fit a uh, sand eraser for electric erasers. Now this is something I'm just kind of experimenting with and it's something I'll definitely make a video about in the future and talking about. But if you want to use an electric eraser, you're going to need uh, sand erasers to put inside it. The regular soft white ones that come with it are not aggressive enough to remove paint. So I'm putting up on the screen now the brand I like. Uh, you can get these on Amazon. They're about five to 10 bucks for a box and, and they'll last a very long time. Time. Switching back to my airbrush, I'm going to use the transparent flesh tone that we mixed in the first video to add some of the darker shadows around the face and around the nasal bone here. So after I have some of these values in, I always go back to switching to my eraser and pulling out a few of the highlights. Remember, when you pull out highlights on this, you're going right down to the substrate. So in this case, we have gessoed canvas, so these highlights are going to be very bright. So once I pull them out, I generally go back to my original tone, my original flesh tone, and spray it back over it to darken it. When you're painting, the hue of the shadow is generally the opposite temperature of the highlight area. So if you look at the shadows around the eye here, they're still slightly too warm um, and the image has kind of a monochromatic look. So what I like to do is I can add a little bit of black thin down with some water and lightly spray it over these areas to help darken them up. This way, it's not only going to darken them and change the value, but it's also going to shift the hue so that the shadow here is slightly cooler and it, it it helps give a more realistic uh, look to the image itself. You have to be very careful when using black because we're not spraying it on blank canvas. What we're doing is we're optically mixing it into the paint that we already have down to help shift the temperature to be slightly cooler. And this is going to help break up any of that uniform color look, that, that monochromatic look that you usually get if you're only using one color. There are many ways to shift the temperature of a shadow, but the easiest way is to use some black. So to keep it simple, that's what I'm using in this part of the portrait. Moving over to the ear, I'm using some frisket film to mask it from the background. For a smaller area that has a bunch of curves like an ear, I find something like frisket film works better than vinyl tape. So the brand I use comes in a roll and it's made by Art Tool. Once those areas are down and cut out, we have a nice area to work on without having to worry about any overspray. Now while painting the ear, I'm using the same colors we used before in that transparent flesh tone we mixed. And what I'm doing is looking at my reference and trying to map in the large areas of shadow. So I'm looking for any dark areas and kind of squinting my eyes while looking at the reference so I see large masses of shadow and masses of highlights. And then all I do is I use a small shield to come in and place those in so I have a sharp edge on them. If the edge is too sharp, we could always erase it um, or erase around the edges later to soften it up. So this video is obviously sped up, but in about five minutes when I remove the frisket film off here, you can see that it looks pretty close to what we want for an ear. Obviously it's not perfect, there's things we're going to have to adjust, but here now we can go in freehand and start cleaning up and adding in some more detail. 
And to darken these areas up, I'm using the exact same paint, a transparent color. All I'm doing is spraying more of it. So as those layers build up, they get darker. If you want to shift the value to a slightly cooler tone, we can do what we did before by adding um, some pure black right on top of it. Or if you want to use a more neutral color, you could even use sepia, and that'll help darken it and kind of uh, mellow out the, the color so it doesn't look too warm, more of a neutral shade. If you're new to painting and you struggle with something like the ear, the best thing to do is put the paintbrushes away for a while and just switch over to drawing. Drawing is such an amazing way to learn about everything all around us and to learn about values, darks and lights and different textures. And the, the amazing thing about it is it's inexpensive and you can do it anywhere. You don't have to worry about setting up compressors and thinning paint. You can do it quickly and you can really get the same effects that you can with paint with a pencil. It just, it takes a little bit more time to, to fill in larger areas, but it's such a great way to practice and improve your skills. And I guarantee you that anything you learn in uh, pencil drawing and graphite drawing will translate right over to painting or airbrush painting. And in my opinion, it translates best to airbrush painting because so much of using the airbrush is switching over to that eraser to remove highlights. And when you draw, you're doing the exact same thing. So I promise you, the better you get at drawing, the better you'll get at painting with an airbrush. With that transparent flesh tone that we pre-mixed, um, adding in some of the value on the left side of the face here. I like to hold the airbrush about six to 10 inches away when spraying a large area like this and just go nice and slow and try to build the value up. So let's move along down to the nose here. Now I have all my lines drawn out in graphite from the original transfer over to this. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to start with the area farthest away from us. So that would be the nostril. And what I'm doing is just laying in a very light amount of paint using my airbrush shield. And after I put in a few lines or a few dark areas of this paint, I can adjust those lines with my eraser and kind of thin them out and clean them up. When you're spraying in thin lines or thin shadows like I'm doing here around the outside of the nose, sometimes it's difficult with an airbrush to keep that line thin and consistent. So when the canvas is blank like this, if you spray it a little bit too wide, you can switch over to your eraser and clean it up and just get that line thinner so you have that thin shadow. That's what I like to do for any area that requires a lot of detail. Keep the canvas blank put down the value where I want it to be, and then clean it up with the eraser and adjust it as needed. So once I have some of these shadows in under and around the nose, and I have the two nostrils added in, I could use my paint to start defining the shapes of the nose. This is one of the reasons I prefer using a transparent paint over an opaque paint, because these dark values uh, where the nostrils are, are already laid in. So when I spray over this, those values are just gonna slightly darken with the transparent color. If I was to use an opaque color, and that color is slightly lighter, it's gonna lighten those areas. So it's nice that I could just glaze over this entire area of the nose and adjust the value as needed, and not worry about removing or negating some of the dark areas that I placed in uh, before. And once we have some of the lighter values in on the nose, we could switch over to the eraser to start adding some texture. The nose has a lot of pores on it and generally has slightly more texture than other areas of the face, like the chin um, or parts of the cheek. So you can get um, a little aggressive with your eraser and pull out some brighter highlights within the nose to give it a little bit more of that realistic look of a skin texture. And your most important tool here is your observation. You have to really look at your reference and study it to see where these highlights are. And you get better at that with time. I've been doing this for a long time and I still feel like it's a constant learning process and I'm always improving. So I don't think that's something you ever perfect. I think it's a lifelong learning thing. And we're so lucky today to have all these photographs and cameras available that we can use to practice and study from. Because in the past, this all had to be done from life. And a lot of artists, myself included today, still work from life. And it's a great way to learn. But if you're really sitting down and try to study basic things, a photograph is such a great tool to practice and learn from. So moving along to the next part, which are the lips, I just want to say that I have a tutorial on this that I'm going to link down below that goes into the basics on how to paint this and what colors to use. And I think that one may be more helpful uh, because it goes into a slight more detail than I'm going to go into in this video. So with that being said, for the color here, I'm using the same flesh tone, but I altered it slightly. I shifted the hue slightly toward red by adding a few drops of scarlet into it. This way my hue is shifted slightly more toward red and the values darken slightly. 
Lips have a lot of texture to them, and it's best always to study your reference. I could see here that the light is basically shining from the left side of the portrait over to the right, so the highlights are going to be on the left side um, on each crease in the lips. But it's important to remember that every single time you have a highlight, you need to have a shadow next to it. That's going to create that 3D look where you have some areas going up and then some areas going away from you. And if you look close at any skin texture, there's a lot of that going on. So what I'm doing is looking at my reference trying to see where the highlights are and doing the best I can to place them in areas that are close enough. You know, I'm not going for absolute perfection photorealism here, but enough to suggest that there's a highlight here and a shadow right next to it. For the shadows here, I'm using black to fill in these dark areas between the lips. Um, you know, this color may be slightly too cool and maybe giving a, a grayish look to the image. So if you'd like, you can substitute this uh, with sepia and that'll work just fine to darken it and give you a, a more neutral shadow rather than a cooler one like the black does. So I'm going to start wrapping this video up here. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a thing or two. As I make more videos, I'll figure out how to balance the amount of information that I have in each video and the length because I don't want these videos to be too long. So if you're working on painting a portrait and you have any questions or problems, just leave me a comment down below in the comment section and I'll get back to you and try to help you out. Thank you so much, all of you who left me comments in some of my other videos. It's very nice to hear from everyone, and I definitely appreciate it. And thank you so much to all of you who subscribe to this channel, because it really helps me out, and it, it means a lot to me, so I appreciate it. So that's going to do it for this one. I have plenty more videos coming up in the next few weeks and months, so I hope you come back to check those out. So thanks again. I'll see you next time.